Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's program, a panel discussion about Virginians and their histories, which is a groundbreaking new book published by the University of Virginia Press in partnership with the Library of Virginia. I'm Sandy Treadway, the Librarian of Virginia, and I'm delighted that you've been able to join us this afternoon for what I know will be a very stimulating conversation. We have a few other programs coming up in the very near future that I just wanted to mention before we begin. The library hosts two vibrant virtual book clubs, and they will both be meeting in March. Uh, one will be discussing the book, The Organ Thieves by Chip Jones, and the other will be discussing Becoming Mary Sully, which is a book about a, a very wonderful but unknown uh, Native American artist uh, written by Philip Deloria. <clears throat> we also have a genealogy workshop coming up called Discovering Your Virginia Roots, and that will be Friday, March 12th. So please check the library's calendar of events, and also there will be a link in the chat box um, to make it easier for you to get more information about those programs. And if you haven't already read today's book, I know by the end of the program you will want to, uh, so we hope that you will um, uh, purchase a copy, and you can certainly purchase one in person or online through the Virginia shop here at the library. Now, Virginians and Their Histories presents a fresh new narrative that weaves together the experiences of all people who have called Virginia their home from the earliest days of recorded history to the early 21st century. With us this afternoon is the author of this book, Brent Tarter. Now, I know Brent needs virtually no introduction to anyone who researches or reads Virginia history. Brent was a founding editor of the Dictionary of Virginia Biography Project here at the library and retired a number of years ago. And since that time, he has been publishing and writing books about Virginia history um, faster than any of us can keep up with them. Among those that he's, he's done in, uh, most recently uh, are Gerrymandering, How Redistricting has protected slavery, white supremacy, and partisan minorities. The grandees of government, the origins and persistence of undemocratic politics in Virginia, and of course, the volume we're, we're discussing today, which really draws on Brent's mastery of the historiography and the documentary record for Virginia's past. I'm thrilled that we also have with us two seasoned historians whose work has moved our understanding of Virginia's history forward in important ways as well. Sarah Hand Meacham, Associate Professor of History at Virginia Commonwealth University, specializes in colonial American history. She's the author of Every Home a Distillery, Alcohol, Technology, and Gender in the Early Chesapeake, published by Johns Hopkins University Press, uh, a book that addresses how and why the making of alcoholic beverages, which was long a part of women's cookery and women's expertise, came to be redefined as a scientific activity and the purview of men alone. Sarah's published articles in the Virginia Magazine of History and Biography, Early American Studies, the Journal of Southern History, and many other publications and an essay about the establishment of an early orphanage for girls here in Richmond in Virginia Women, Their Lives and Times. Sarah's currently writing a book about when and why American colonists invented the idea that human beings ought to be cheerful, how they tried to force themselves to generate cheerfulness and the rise and fall and the rise again of smiling. Uh, something I'm looking forward to down the road. Our third panelist is Brian Daughtry, also an associate professor of history at Virginia Commonwealth University and an expert in modern Virginia and U.S. history and the history of the civil rights movement. He's the co-editor of a volume of essays titled With All Deliberate Speed, Implementing Brown versus the Board of Education, 1865-1968, 
In 2016, he published Keep On Keeping On, the NAACP and the implementation of Brown, uh, published by the University of Virginia Press, and more recently co-edited a volume of primary sources titled a, a Little Child Shall Lead Them, and that is also about the struggle to desegregate the public schools in uh, Prince Edward County, Virginia. He's currently working on several projects related to the 1968 Supreme Court decision, Green versus New Kent County, Virginia. I am looking forward to sitting back and listening to these three engaging and accomplished scholars. And without further ado, I turn the program over to them. Thanks so much. Thank you for the introduction, Sandy. Appreciate your joining us. I especially want to thank Sarah and Brian for joining us. Um, most of the time when you publish a new book, you go out and you make a talk. We can't go out and make talks. I didn't want to go out and make a talk anyway. I have found that when we engage in a conversation about something of mutual interest, it's much more engaging for the audience. So I invited Sarah and Brian to join me. And I don't know whether they're going to say good things or bad things. I have no idea what they're going to say, but I think it will probably be better than you're just listening to me for the next hour. I should probably start for a minute or two, though, and say how this book came to be written. You know, there are histories of Virginia on the bookshelf and in the bookstores. You can buy them and read them. But all of us historians have our own take on parts of the past. I have had uh, the unusual or perhaps even unique opportunity with my colleagues here in the Library of Virginia to do research in the original primary source records of every decade of Virginia's English language history. I've been doing this for 50 years nearly. And during that time, I have read a remarkable body of new historical scholarship. Uh, this has been the golden age of good historical work on Virginia. Uh, graduate students and professors and amateurs and people who are interested in the past have published an enormous amount of wonderful literature that helps us reevaluate what we thought we knew and has filled in some very, very big gaps in our knowledge. Um, so I wanted to share with other people some of the things that I have learned and some of the insights that I have gained. You know, as we research a topic, go deeply into a narrow subject or a time period or a, a, an event, you learn new things. The new things make you see that event differently. And in turn, if that event is different, then the larger context may need to change. And if the larger context changes enough, then how you interpret those individual events also changes. That's what I've been doing all of my career. And that's why I thought I will just share my view of Virginia history with other people. Now, how well I succeeded or how badly I failed is not for me to say. And in part, that's why I asked Sarah and Brian to come on here so that if there's anything good to say, they could say it and I don't have to. And if there's anything that needs to be said in criticism of it that potential readers might want to know, that's fine too. So thank you, uh, Sarah and Brian, for joining us. Uh, I hope that we have an engaging conversation, but I will not talk anymore except as part of the conversation with them. And then at the end, if we have some audience questions, uh, we can deal with them toward the end of the hour. So Sarah, Brian, what do you all think? Well, thank you so much, uh, Brent, for taking the time to tell us a little bit about the genesis of the book. I'd like to thank the Library of Virginia for hosting this event and for inviting me to participate. I'd like to thank my colleague at Virginia Commonwealth University for joining us. And I'd like to thank um, Sandy for the kind introduction. And um, Brent, I really enjoyed reading this book. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of this discussion. Um, the first question that I wanted to ask you is about how you um, are re-envisioning, if you will, the narrative of Virginia history in Virginians and their history. Um, you talked in the introduction about the, uh, the new narrative that you're offering in this book. And I wanted you to expand on that new narrative and how Virginians, um, how Virginia historians have portrayed Virginia in the past. 
Well, that's a good question. Um, when I first started studying and reading Virginia history, we had what I have come to call a master narrative. It's very like the narrative histories of the United States. Um, it's a, in a triumphal tone, advancement of democratic institutions and improvement of Anglo-American civilization, um, which tended to be rooted in political and military events the same way that our national historical narrative has been rooted. Uh, you know, we talk about decades or centuries or presidential administrations or antebellum periods as if there were only one antebellum period. You know, every period is before some war or other. Um, but that tends to leave out some, what I think are very interesting bits of history that some of my friends have been publishing fantastic books on during the last 30 or 40 years. We know so much more now about the experiences of women than we used to. Um, there's a great new body of literature on the institution of slavery and on racism in Virginia. Uh, we now know more about the religious and cultural histories of Virginia than we used to. Uh, we know or are now at least paying more attention to the demographic changes that have taken place in Virginia. And those tend to highlight some of the long-term themes that I wanted to emphasize when I began to write this book. You know, uh, Virginians have never been a, a homogeneous group of people. Uh, you can't talk about Virginians as if they all experienced an event the same way or they all uh, had the same kind of experiences. Uh, you have to think about what we all share but we also have to think about our differences. There are big regional differences within the state and always have been. There are class differences within the state and always have been. There are problems of race relations in the state and always have been. So if we take a more comprehensive view of Virginia that gets away from a narrative that is driven by politics and think about how Virginians lived and how the events of their lives enabled them to live or prevented them from living, then you get, I think, a more personal view. That's one reason why I wanted to include words of the people who lived through some of the important events of Virginia's history to let them, as it were, speak to the reader directly and not have it just be all me. So this, this narrative, I think, is more inclusive than many of the others, both in terms of uh, how it perceives the different kinds of Virginians that have existed and do exist, as well as taking uh, a broader account of the many uh, economic, social, cultural, religious, demographic phenomena that affect how we live even today. Brent, one of the things I really enjoyed um, about your book is both that it's this magnificent uh, synthesis, right? So I think you've synthesized works from 1892 to 2017, maybe 18, um, and that you really show how historians kind of do history. Um, so last night I was looking again at, you have this great section on um, how can we tell what sorts of towns there were in the 18th century? And you have this great section on um, descriptions of storms and hurricanes and how we can kind of read uh, the descriptions of what was destroyed to tell what had existed. Um, so it shows people how historians use sources. Um, and I think you're also incredibly successful at showing how Virginia has always been a global society, right? That this is nothing new, that that's part of your new narrative is that Virginia has always been a global society. Um, and all of this is wind up to getting to my question, which is that you began uh, talking about the your new narrative, right? The new narrative of Virginia history. And you talked about how when you started out, there were these grand narratives. And I wonder if that's um, why you started the book with the uh, Turner thesis. Why did you start with the uh, the Jackson Turner narrative? That's my uh, question. For those, 
for those who don't know, Frederick Jackson Turner was a very, very influential late 19th, early 20th century Virginia historian who proposed in 1892 and three what's called the frontier thesis that as uh, Americans moved across the landscape from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, they created a series of frontier experiences that shaped the essence of American democracy. That no longer guides all of our historical thinking anymore. And I really did not want to set up Turner's frontier thesis as a straw person. What I wanted to do, and I decided to do this from the very beginning when the idea of a book first occurred to me more than 15 years ago, is I wanted to start the book at Cumberland Gap, not at Jamestown, because all of our narratives really pick up speed with the settlement of Jamestown, as if that's the beginning. And it's always a historical narrative that's looking to the West from the East. I didn't want to get trapped into other people's perspectives. I didn't want to write about decades and centuries as if they were real phenomena. They are simply artificial time periods. I didn't want to uh, pick up where somebody else had left off. So I decided, well, why don't I start with a chapter and call The View from Cumberland Gap? And just look at history differently. I even thought at one time that I might try to write the entire history of Virginia as one long, incomplete, run on sentence to weave all the stories together. Of course, you can't do that. I did write my first draft with no chapter breaks, no artificial barriers. I didn't want to get trapped in other people's schemes of periodization. For instance, this, this is a particular problem, I think, with, with writing the 19th century, is nearly everybody writes something that goes up to the Civil War, or they write something about the Civil War, or they write something about what happened after the Civil War. But the Civil War, important as it was, is an event in a long time period. We ought to look, view the Civil War and its causes and consequences as in the middle of a time period, not as the end or the beginning. So I was trying not to get trapped in other people's perspectives. Now, maybe I create some false perspectives by doing this in my different way, but it enabled me to make use of all this new literature that offers wonderful insights, a tremendous amount of excellent information, and meld that with the information that I found in the original records of doing my own research. Um, you know, you do that for 50 years, you have your own view. And so that's how this comes out. I didn't want it to be just another uh, one damn thing after another, as I think Henry Ford is supposed to have said, but it's stories. It's a long, complex set of interwoven human dramas, and I wanted to, I wanted the readers to be able to see something that I had about how much the activities of people who live here shape how we live, but also how much outside events shape how we live economic changes, technological changes, uh, you know, just think about the internet or think about the railroads, or think about the postal system. Those things affect how we live. We don't so much affect them. So that, uh, you know, at the final analysis, I want people to see how folks in Virginia have lived and have an appreciation for the wide variety of circumstances that enable us to live this way or require us to live this way. Does that answer the question? It's a good question. Brent, a lot of the focus of the book is on everyday Virginians and life in, every, in Virginia uh, for ordinary citizens and so forth, um, residents. I was curious if you had any favorite stories from the book that you'd like to share with the audience. Oh, my goodness. You know, when you try to write about 400 years of English language history plus several thousand years before that, um, the problem is, what do you not include? I, you know, if I had tried to put in everything that was interesting, I would be writing well after my death. I never would get through. But, uh, you know, it is the how individuals cope with difficulty that has begun to attract my attention. Like many other historians, I began studying politics, 20th century progressive New Dealer people like that. And the reason I think that subject attracted me was that how much 
those political questions and those governmental programs directly changed how people lived. And one of the books I wanted to write when I was young, I was going to entitle Let There Be Light. It would be a book about the work of the Rural Electrification Administration in the 1930s, one of the New Deal programs that allowed people in the countryside for the first time to have electricity so that they could have an electric light to, for their students to read and study by, so that they could have a radio and get the news, so that they could have a reliable electric pump and actually have indoor plumbing. Now, what is more important than that to somebody who's living on a farm? The electricity is absolutely critical. I wasn't so much interested in the politics of the creation of the REA as what difference it made in the lives of people. And so I, think I, kept, I keep coming back to those um, aspects of our shared history, some things that we share and some things that we don't share. And so what I tried to do is use some of the anecdotes or choice quotations that I found in the original historical record to let people explain to the readers how these events or these changes um, shaped their lives. I don't know, I hope I'm successful on that. Um, I think it, it's a technique that should work better than simply having me explain what I think it all means. I noticed that you started a lot of chapters with politics and you have lived through the social history term and now we're living through what's called the narrative turn. Um, and so I was curious about that decision. So not all chapters, but many chapters start with political history, political history, and then sometimes they move into religious history and then uh, different forms of social history. And I was wondering why, why start the chapters with political history? Right, so some other might have been to start with like little commonwealths, the family or um, anyway. So yeah, why why start with political history? Well, I, I wrote each chapter separately. I didn't actually plan to start them as many of them as I did with big public events. But that does, I think, work to engage the reader by giving you a context. Okay, Here we have a settlement of Jamestown. Here we have a secession crisis. Uh, here we have the Great Depression. Uh, here we have the beginnings of the Civil Rights Movement. And I do uh, think that I chose each of the chapter beginnings to try to draw in the reader. You know, they teach you in journalism school, you're writing for a newspaper, you have like six seconds. And if you lose your audience before that's over, they won't read your article. So, you know, writing that first sentence or that first paragraph, um, is critical to setting up what you want to do with what comes later. If there are more of these that are political than I realized, uh, that's an accident. But you know, it, we, when I first started studying history, almost everybody did politics. There was even a new political history at that time. Now we know more about more aspects of human lives than we did then. But the politics and the government are still important. They influence us and our lives in many, many ways. You know, my friends who do religious history or friends like Sarah who do women's history, uh, they're interested in politics too. Politics. Why do we care who gets elected? Why do we care who's on the Supreme Court if politics and law are not important? So they have to, they have to feature there. But I just did not want the book to uh, have as its spine a narrative of political events and elections. That it doesn't come across that way. I was, I was just wondering, um, because you have, right? You have been through um, these various transitions in American historical scholarship. So I was wondering um, why that that decision and that your answer answers it. Just the way I wanted to tell the story. I mean, history, historical literature started as a branch of literature, not just as a branch of analysis, uh, like the social sciences, but as a, as a variety of literature. And I think history ought to be fun to read. You know, I read it all the time, and I'm very disappointed when I find something that is not fun to read. 
Well, this is certainly fun to read, extremely well written and organized and very enjoyable. Frank. So you've succeeded in that regard. I wanted to ask you a question um, about how, you know, some of the challenges that you faced when you were either writing or publishing the book, what were the principal difficulties that you had, um, maybe for the new authors out there? Certainly you have experience um, with publishing a number of books already. Well, most of what I have done has been like what you and Sarah and most other scholars do, which is focus carefully on a, a discrete topic or an event so that you do not have the problem that I faced with this book of how do I organize several thousand years of narrative? What do you put in? What do you leave out? How chronological can you be or should you be? I mean, history happens one event after another, but if you set them all down in their discrete orders, you know, then on Tuesday this happened, and then on Wednesday that happened, and then on Thursday the next thing happened, you do not have history. You don't have literature. You have a chronicle. So how do you tell these interrelated stories? I mean, one of the great challenges was figuring out how to do it because the narratives of political change move at a different rhythm and a different pace than economic change. They're different from demographic change. They're different from social change. So if you just line the events up, you do not have anything that's intelligible. But if you write about them as entirely distinct from each other, then you don't have, you know, then you have a crazy quilt. You do not have a, a, a set of continuing stories. So I had to let the chronology slip a little bit. For instance, uh, I have a chapter early in the book that deals with the rise of tobacco planting and the institution of slavery. Now that chapter covers uh, three quarters of a century, which means that it overlaps some of the social and institutional history that precedes it, and it overlaps some of the social and political history that follows it. But I thought I had better keep all of this together so that I could try to make my point about the nature of the tobacco planting economy and the nature of the slavery that it created. Uh, similarly, for the civil rights period, I devoted one long chapter to that, even though the civil rights movement really got started way back before the Great Depression, and it lasted long past the last of the civil rights acts of the 1960s and the important court cases. Um, because this is an important story on its own. Uh, it meant uh, writing and rewriting and rewriting transitions and chapter introductions and chapter conclusions so that the uh, gaps between the chapters were not too startling. And too, but it, you know, you'd have to let the chronology relax and lap over a little bit. That was one of the most interesting challenges that I faced. It, it posed difficulties, but you know, writing is a creative process, and that also, to me, is an enjoyable process. So I, I hope I succeeded in that way, too, by focusing enough so that each one of the discrete portions of this book can stand by itself, but that they still fit in with the larger whole. Oh, that work. Brent, do you have, um, so I've been thinking about how well this will work in high school and college classrooms. <clears throat> Excuse me, how well this will work, this book will work, Virginians and their histories will work in high school and college classrooms. And I'm wondering if you have like a documents reader in mind to go along with it, or if you're working on something like that. I've also thought about how I could pull out um, the sources that you have already cited in the book and pull out longer versions of them. But I'm wondering if you're working on something like that or if you're working on something now. I have accumulated transcriptions of parts or all of a vast many documents. So many that if you put them all together, it's overwhelmingly large or something. At one time, I thought I might just line them all up chronologically uh, and have a a plural first person narrative of Virginia's history, but it was too much. It was too much. Uh, and most of it consisted of incomplete stories, just a, a 
an excerpt from a letter or a newspaper or a piece of court testimony that told part of a story, but that illuminated an event or a time or, or a phenomenon. I don't know whether I will go back to that. Uh, that's a very big, different kind of project. I did use excerpts from many of those texts in this book, and not only so that the people from the past could speak more or less directly to the readers in the future, but also I was hoping that some of these anecdotes and some of these quotations from the past would be useful to teachers in the lower grades to stimulate a classroom discussion of what was it like to be enslaved? What was it like to be on the frontier? What was it like to be in a war? What was it like to you know, be, be a woman uh, who was subject to pregnancies every three or four years and frequently died of them? I mean, I wanted people to, to understand this history from a, a very personal point of view. So I did use a good deal of the, that kind of language and I did it with teachers in mind. I mean, the teachers were one of the primary audiences I had in mind from the very beginning um, because I, I've always believed that history is, should be based in interest in human beings. And if the human beings are there and their experiences and their words are there, you're much more likely to engage a young person in thinking about it as an interesting topic rather than a boring list of things to memorize, which I know that's what I encountered when I was a child in school. And I think too many people do, which is why they think they're not interested in history. But they watch the History Channel, don't they? Well, I certainly enjoyed the anecdotes and the primary source um, information that you included and um, think it added quite a bit to the story. Uh, perhaps some enterprising individual will pull together a collection of documents as Sarah has mentioned. I think it would be very helpful um, for teachers and, and professors who are engaged in this story. Um, Brent, one of the things that you're attempting to do in this book is to dispel some of the myths about Virginia history. And I'm wondering what are the what are the biggest myths about Virginia history and and, and how would you uh, envision this book trying to combat some of that? Well, I did uh, take pot shots at a few durable old myths um, that in and of themselves may not be very important. I did it in part to meet an objective that I think Sarah mentioned earlier, which is to give some sense of how we understand the past. You know, we read documents, we look at images, we look at maps, uh, we sometimes read dead people's mail, we listen to the music that they heard or wrote, we look at the art that they made, we're just trying to figure them out. But that's not history, that's not historical narrative. What I wanted to do was to enable these things to speak for themselves in a way that would that would attract interest and, and that would hold interest and it would teach us something about the past. I'm not sure that I answered your question very well. Uh, that's okay. I'm, I'm I'm very interested in the in the approach that you were taking to the book, and so um... yeah. Well, you know, there there are myths. Um, some of them were unimportant. I think the, the myth of the first Thanksgiving of 1619 is, uh, I think that story is completely wrong and it doesn't matter a bit. But if you look at last summer, you see historical revisionism at work in the streets. People have changed the meaning of the landscape. Once upon a time, white supremacists put up Confederate monuments all over the place to change the meaning of the Civil War, to teach a myth that the Civil War was about Southern rights and state rights and not about slavery. Well, the, the historical record will not bear that out. It just absolutely is not so. I cannot imagine believing that. So after I spent years reading what people in 1861 were saying. Now, that's a myth. I do not specifically discuss it as a myth but in my treatment of the Civil War, it's quite clear I don't believe that. And I don't think anybody else should believe it. Civil War was about preserving a slave society in the South, period. 
you know, we there are other things that are not quite myths, but they are, I think, misperceptions. As an historical historian of the civil rights movement, Brian, you certainly understand this. The civil rights movement didn't begin in 1954 with Brown versus Civil of Education, and it didn't end in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. Civil rights agitation had been around for decades. The civil rights movement was disparate, was different, different places at different times. One of the things that struck me and that I'm trying to emphasize in here is the civil rights movement in Virginia was not the same as the civil rights movement in some other places. You know, we had comparatively little street violence, especially in compared to say Alabama and Mississippi. We had very little that even approached violence with the desegregation of the schools, although Virginia politicians led the massive resistance to that desegregation. But if you look at the civil rights movement in Virginia, it was overwhelmingly a sequence of courtroom dramas. Now, this is interesting to me. Here you have black civil rights lawyers representing white parents and white students going into the court using white people's jurisprudence to invalidate white people's unjust laws. I think that's a great story. You know, the, the, the civil rights lawyers in this state were the best in the country. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But the parents and the teachers are the ones who started the cases. That's a very democratic movement. It's a wonderful thing to think about the civil rights movement as a democratic and democratizing movement that worked through established political and legal systems in Virginia, more so than in any other state. Now, I'm not sure I can explain why that was, but I have no doubt that it was that way. And I find that an inspiring story. Uh, it made a revolution in the way we lived without creating a revolutionary war. Not not a very well known story either, friend. So I really uh, applaud you for going into such detail. Okay, well, I hope I'm right. I hope you agree with me. <laughs> I did. I Good. did. I enjoyed reading. Um, and I appreciated that you explained that women worked outside the home before the 20th century, um, which is a a battle I fight. So I very much appreciated that you brought that up. Well, that in effect is another myth, you know, that, that women stayed at home and raped children that didn't work. Well, of course they did. They worked harder and longer than most men in most households, in most centuries, in most places. Um, that's an important part of the history that I learned nothing about when I was a college student or a graduate student. Uh, this kind of historical analysis and literature didn't exist then. Uh, I have learned from it, and I have tried to incorporate some of it. Uh, into my own work. I remember about 20 years ago, I went to uh, Withville to a meeting of the Wythe County Historical Society. They asked me to come down and talk about women's history. I didn't ask a woman, I don't know. They asked me, so I went. And, and what am I going to say? Well, I decided to um, entitle my little talk, Add the Women in Stirwell. A kitchen metaphor. Okay, women. Maybe that's <clears throat> maybe that wasn't in the best of taste. But what I said in my talk was that now that we learn about how women have lived in Virginia, black women, white women, old women, young men, uh, women in the east and the west and the mountains and the bay, it doesn't just enrich our understanding of the past the way the first women historians said that it would. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you add the women and stir the historical narrative, the whole historical narrative has to change. It shifts your viewpoint away from politics and the military in the past. It shifts yourself away from the labor market. It shifts your focus towards real people, towards mothers and daughters and grandmothers and and toward families in particular. So I think that if you, uh, the broader view you take, the different your perspective will be. In the same way that the deeper you dig into a subject, the more understanding you will gain. So just, just having the women in the story 
is not just having the women in the story. It changes the story profoundly. Uh, you know, just imagine trying to write American history without anything in it about race. Well, we, you know, historians did that for a long time. They wrote without anything about women for an even longer time. And still, for the most part, we write without very much about children. I mean, you know, we write about schools and education, but that's not writing about children. So there are still big aspects of our culture that historians do not understand very well, or they have not figured out how all the parts fit together. I regret that we have much less than we should have of good economic and industrial history about different aspects in Virginia. I mean, we know about the rise and fall of coal mining in the West, but that's only just one thing. Um, trying to figure out something about the history of banks and finance, and capitalism in Virginia is very difficult yet. Those, those subjects are books yet to be written. Uh, at one time, I used to annoy a lot of people. I'd go around to them all the time, tell them about good subjects that occurred to me. Now, please write this book because I want to read it. Anyway, um, this is this is what we do. We try to gain different kinds of new understandings about the small parts of the picture and the big parts of the picture. And I really like in your book that you try to add one of the biggest parts of the picture, which is um, the environment and geography, history of geography. Um, you have these kind of bookends um, with your book, right? With the uh, beginning of the shaping of the environment in Virginia and how that shaped people's experiences. And then you are ending with uh, changing Atlantic Ocean temperatures and hurricanes. Um, and I was thinking about when you were talking about challenges, if it was a challenge to work in kind of this very slow history of geography. No, in fact, I wanted to do that from the very beginning because, you know, we live in a, a place. Virginia is not a place. It's a name for a place. Um, we all live here and it is constantly changing too. You know, the geographic climate, the economic climate, the religious and cultural climates, they all change and they change differently in different places. You know, if you live in Appalachia, you notice economic, social and cultural changes very different than if you live in Northern Virginia, very different if you live in Brunswick County, very different if you live in Portsmouth. And so I wanted this to be evident. The geographical variation in Virginia has always influenced how people live in its various parts. Moreover, by focusing on this aspect of very fundamental aspect of our changing environment, it allowed me to um, introduce more into the book of the subject of diversity within Virginia, which is particularly important now. It, you know, Virginia has always been a more diverse place than it looked like, but differences, regional differences have always been important too. And that's rooted in the geography and in the climatic differences for the different parts of the state. So, you know, always from the beginning, I wanted to start at Cumberland Gap, prehistoric times, and I wanted to conclude with something about the world in which we are living, which is now changing. You know, Virginia is a more diverse state now than it's ever been before, more diverse economically, more diverse culturally, more diverse religiously, more diverse ethnically, and it's getting more so. Well, we are diverse climatically too. So I, I, the, the difficult thing was figuring out what the very last page of the book should be like, because I wanted that uh, environmental theme to carry all the way through. But I also wanted to avoid something. I remember many years uh, hearing a, a Monacan friend of mine say, you know, the trouble with American history is that it's the first 15 pages. American history, Virginia history, they write about the Indians and forget them thereafter. Well, the very last section of the last chapter of my book, I revert back to what I cleverly call the very first families of Virginia, the Virginia Indians. So the book actually opens and closes with Indians who in most other books appear only in a 17th century context. But, you know, 
as they were saying in 2007 when the chiefs went to London on their diplomatic commission, we are still here. I think that we're probably at about the time where we should pause and see whether there are any questions or comments or nasty objections have come in on the chat while we were talking. My friend and colleague, Emma Ito, I think, is manning the booth and will uh, relay to us any questions or comments that, uh, that she thinks are appropriate. Yes, thank you, Brent, and thank you for introducing me. So I'm not a just a voice here. Um, this is Emma Ito speaking. I'm an education and program specialist. Um, and Brent, I got a couple of questions uh, that in here that I'd like to ask you. And one of them is, what were some of the more unusual or underused sources that informed your work? Oh my goodness, uh, I've done so many different kinds of research on so many different kinds of subjects, but uh, people might be surprised at how often court records provide good stories and juicy quotations. You know, if you're living in the modern world, we think about going to getting on the internet or maybe picking up a newspaper or a magazine to look for uh, information about an event or to figure out what happened. But in the earlier centuries, much of that kind of information was recorded only in court records. You know, I, I tell uh, people, ask me what historians do, and I say, well, we're just like a police officer trying to solve a crime. We follow the money. Money and property created records, deeds, wills, and other records that would not have been created without property, and that they're frequently the only records that survive. Disputes do the same thing. People go into court to fight one another, frequently about property. It's, it's wonderful what you can stumble across in court records. Many of the things that I've uh, found most entertaining have been purely by accident because I was looking for something else. I recall there's a, I forget which county, one of the county court records from about the 1730s or 1740s records a, a, a prosecution of an innkeeper for this reason, he sold somebody more alcohol than was necessary during time of divine services. Well, how much alcohol is necessary during time? You know, I don't know. Uh, I just thought that was funny as all get out. But it does indicate something, too, you know, that the courts, the government was monitoring people's behavior. They were regulating commerce. They were interested in their morality. They were interested in religion. All these things come out of that one tiny little episode that struck me because it was funny the way that it was worded. So the, the court records in the olden days are very valuable. Uh, petitions to the General Assembly are very valuable. Uh, between the Revolution and the Civil War, you know, there was almost no state bureaucracy then. So if you wanted something from the government, if you wanted a pension for your Revolutionary War service, for instance, or if your husband went off to war in the War of 1812 and got killed and you needed relief, there was no government bureaucracy you could go to. People sent a petition to the General Assembly asking for relief or passage of a special law to enable you to make it through this hard time. And those petitions contain wonderful stories about everything you can imagine and some other things you couldn't imagine. You also had to petition the General Assembly and the years before the Civil War for a divorce. So you get lots of really fascinating insights into family lives where the family has gone wrong. That helps you understand what the boundaries were between what was acceptable and what was not acceptable in gender relations and in family relationships and in marriages. So the, the sources like that that, uh, that teach us a great deal. Um, you can't go just to one place, you know, you don't just go and read the law, you don't just go and read the court decision, you don't just go and read the newspaper. All of these different classes and varieties of information fall together to give you a, a detailed but broad perspective of what was happening at a particular time or place. So uh, I, to, answer, to try to answer the question, the more records, the better, but there are ones that uh, those of us in these times would not think of first off, such as court records, but they are extremely valuable 
for the more uh, remote past. Good question. Thank you. The next question, Brent, it kind of parallels this last question that you just answered, but what did you find most surprising when you did the research for this book? Oh, my goodness, I don't know. Well, in the first place, I did not research this book. I did research for almost 50 years and then took my information and my insights and tried to craft a narrative that I thought would be interesting and engaging and that as it turns out, is different than some of the other narratives that we have. So, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't really set out to do this, but I had lots of audiences in mind, people I thought might be interested. As I mentioned earlier, I particularly kept school teachers in mind from the very beginning. You know, I write trying to write for that mythical general reader. I don't know that there is, but I do know there are a lot of people who get interested in history after they're out of school and they no, more, no longer have a boring textbook or a boring teacher. Um, I used to review history books for the, the newspaper. For many years I did that, and many of them were really quite bad. They were written by writers who were not historians, and they weren't very good history, but they were good stories. You know, they could write well. And so they sold. They sold because people wanted to read good stories about people. That's what history is. So I tried to keep that in mind too, um, to have a, a storytelling narrative voice in this book that would avoid some of the problems that historians impose on themselves when they write for each other, which was, I didn't want to write about the historical literature because almost nobody wants to read about that. I didn't want to write about how we do our research, which is how we learn. But occasionally, it's, it's I think, instructive to let the reader in on a secret. How do we know this? How do we know that that 1619 Thanksgiving probably didn't occur? Well, we, we know it by reading the record, which I quote in the book directing the settlers who came in 1619 to keep annually the date of their arrival as a day of Thanksgiving. That means the first one should have been in 1620, not in 1619. We also have to know that almost all of the people who came over in that ship in 1619 were either dead or had gone back to London before 1620 anyway. So that was an instance in which I thought, Rather than just say, I don't believe that episode happened, I would explain why I believe that. I think maybe that's a little more instructive, but it's not the same as writing a long historiographical essay that starts with you know, Thucydides and explains the development of historical narratives ever since. I actually have a question now for all three of you is that um, I know Sandy in her introduction mentioned a little bit about what you, you were working on um sarah and brian but sarah brian and brent what are you all working on now that you feel like is contributing to virginia history that isn't very much explored and brent i know you mentioned a few things that aren't explored are you looking into writing something about them no i'm not uh, for the reason that i don't know enough yet to know how to start and i'm not even sure what the resources are for some of these topics, particularly in, in, uh, in business and industrial history. Uh, I have been working uh, for several years and, and have completed a draft of a history of Virginia state constitutions. Uh, now, most people would say, oh my goodness, what a narrow subject that is. There'll only be about nine other readers. Well, maybe so, but I have enjoyed this. Uh, it's a subject that interests me. Uh, I began in college as a political science major, so this maybe I'm reverting to my childhood interests, but government and politics, how they work, are very important because of how they influence how we live. And state constitutions are a seriously neglected subject. Almost nobody writes about them at all. So uh, that's what I've been doing. Sarah, Brian, what are you up to? Writing about cheerfulness, Sarah. Which is about to drive me nuts. Um, <laughs> Yes, so I, um, or my current project on the face of it isn't that Virginia-centric, but the 
So it's a book about how we got the idea starting in the 18th century that in America that we ought to be cheerful um, because you don't see that earlier. So where did we get that idea? How were you supposed to be cheerful? How were you supposed to display cheerfulness? Um, but because my other research has been in Virginia history, I, I pull on a lot of Virginia sources. In fact, I realized that so many of my sources in the book are from Virginia that I'm now going back and checking to make sure that this holds for New England. Um, and I, I'm not certain, but I've been kind of musing about maybe uh, writing on William Byrd of Westover after this. He seems a little uh, neglected lately. How about you, Brian? Thanks for asking. I'm uh, continuing my work on school desegregation in Virginia by focusing on a very important but little known Supreme Court decision that was handed down um, based on a court case that was filed in New Kent County, Virginia in the mid 1960s. Uh, that decision, Green versus New Kent County, Virginia, is the one that really, some people say, put their teeth into Brown versus Board education. A lot of people are recognize it as one of the most important Supreme Court decisions uh, since Brown versus Board Education in terms of civil rights. So I'm working on a documentary film on that case as well as a book manuscript. Um, but like you, I've also got another little idea that I've been toying with quite a bit lately um, that brings together some of my personal interests along with my work. And that is, um, I've been looking at more of the history of the Virginia State Park System. Um, first state park, the first state park system in the country, and a very, um, as you all know, very well, um, well organized, um, well run state park system, and um, so that might be uh, might be my next problem. Well, that brings up another myth in Virginia history. You know, the Virginia state government is very proud of its parks, but you know, the feds built all the first ones back in the New Deal period. Some Virginia Conservation Corps people built the first state parks in Virginia in the 1930s. That's right. And it's been fascinating as I travel the state, visiting state parks and uh, begin to read about the, the story, how much of an impact it has on everyday Virginians. a lot like um, the, the, the stories that you tell on Virginians in their history. So um, whether it's me going down to Pocahontas State Park for an afternoon walk or whether it's uh, other Virginians enjoying the outdoors all across the state. It's, it's definitely a, a story, a little known story that I think is um, kind of near and dear to a lot of us. I'm excited. There's a lot of unknown stories, really are. I'd be very interested to learn more about um, desegregation of the state parks. I found that hard to find information on. Maybe I haven't looked in the right places. And that will obviously, as you know, my work, that will definitely be a part of this story. In fact, I spent a little bit of time uh, last weekend at uh, Twin Lakes State Park in Prince Edward County, which was a, a segregated park uh, back during the era of Jim Crow and has kind of a unique history, um, which uh, will definitely be a, a really important aspect of the story that comes forward. I think we have time to squeeze in one more question. I do want to be respectful of your time and our viewers' time. Um, we did just get a question in of, is anybody looking at the writing on the development of medical methods in schools in Virginia starting in the 1600s? Somebody may be, but I don't know it. Medical methods? Yeah, that's what the, the question asked. Like medical education or um uh, he, added, he added treatments um so the first hmm, in virginia I, I suppose it would be the john galt hospital in williamsburg um, and there's not a whole lot. The records are at William and Mary. Um, there's a, some starting research on Eastern Medical State Hospital. But there's been much more, I think, on Pennsylvania 
because of the creation of the hospital for the Benjamin Rush's hospital for the sick poor starting in the 1730s. Um, so I, I think there's quite a bit of space there to do work on Virginia, those early years of Virginia. I'm not, I just made a list for students of um, students who wanted to do research on kind of healthcare on in uh, early American history. And I, I didn't find anything for Virginia. So I, I think I think that's something that needs to be done. Can I ask Brent what's what's next for you? Um, and by the way, your your book is very affordable too, which is terrific. Well, that's uh, the, you thank the publisher for putting a, a reasonable price on it. I'm I'm delighted that they did, and they actually priced it lower than I thought that they might. So I'm, I'm glad of that. You know, I I hope that uh, people will read it or read in it and maybe learn something and uh, maybe even enjoy it a little bit. And I think um, I think we might have time for one one more if you guys don't mind. I uh, got this last question in and Brent, I know that you mentioned a couple of times that you've been researching for about 50 years now. So how has technology impacted how you do your research and how has that impacted how you share your research? Well, I no longer get my fingers all musty changing the typewriter ribbon. Mm -hmm. um, I am able to make copies of uh, newspaper stories from newspapers I can't even see because somebody digitized them and put them online. I can do that with census records and a great many kinds of documents. It completely changed the way you do research. Uh, especially the preliminary bibliographical work to identify what there is and where it is and how you could get access to it. Um, computers have also been helpful in, in the writing because, my goodness, you know, I did three books back in the 1970s where I had to type everything on a typewriter with two carbon copies, those were the backups, at least three times. If you made a change, you had to retype the whole page. If you made a mistake, you had to retype the whole page. So I spent a vast deal of time just simply pecking away on the typewriter. Um, and I use that time now more creatively. So the technology has changed the way that we work. Uh, I am by no means you know, what we in the profession are referring to as a digital historian who creates historical works in a digital format. I process words much more primitive. But um, no, it is it is changing the way we do our work and it is going to change the way that we get access to other people's work. You know, there are gonna be online exhibitions and online books and electronic ways of conveying information and telling stories that are significantly different from books and magazine articles. Um, I think I'm old enough, I will stick with books and magazine articles, but um, it's changing very fast. There's no doubt about that. And in unpredictable ways. I mean, here I am talking with people on a computer link about a book. And I thank Sarah and Brian very much for taking part and not saying ugly things about the book. I'd like to thank you, Brent, for inviting us and to the Library of Virginia for hosting this. Emma, thank you so much for everything behind the scenes. And Sarah, it's always a pleasure. Thank you to Brent, whose book I have greatly enjoyed, and to the Library of Virginia. Um, and everyone, Brian, just think more eloquently than I could.